Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Howard and this is my talk for the Teens in AI Global COVID-19 Online Hackathon. Uh, I'm a computer scientist based out of Washington DC here in the United States and I'm gonna talk today about a kind of computer program uh, called face recognition. Uh, give me one second, I'm gonna put some slides up. Hopefully we can go through those pretty quickly and then I'm gonna end today with a live demonstration of some face recognition technology. So everyone listening to this is uh, probably familiar with face recognition and, and what it is at a, at least a high level. Uh, and that's because your brain actually does something similar to face recognition several hundred times a day. Uh, so for example, when a friend or a family member walks into a room and your brain tells you, oh, that's my friend Billy, uh, your brain has actually just performed a face recognition task. Uh, it may seem simple or, or kind of benign uh, that our brain does this, uh, but under the hood, it's actually a really complicated process. And I want to take a minute just to point out uh, what is actually happening here. Uh, so first off, when Billy enters the room, uh, your eyes looked at Billy's face and it sent that image uh, to your brain. And your brain then compared it to face images that you had sort of stored up in your memory. And it found Billy and it told other parts of your brain uh, about that. All of this really happens without you even thinking about it or, or recognizing that you're doing it. And it's pretty cool that our brains have actually evolved in this way. Uh, automated face recognition means teaching a computer system how to do the exact same thing your brain does. Uh, but instead of using eyes, computers have to use cameras. Instead of using a brain, computers use something called an algorithm. And instead of using memories to recall friends, uh, computers use databases. Computer scientists have been trying uh, with varying degrees of success to teach computers how to do face recognition systems since about the 1960s. Uh, and it used to be that if you wanted to uh, build and use a face recognition system, it was kind of hard. Uh, you might have to start off in high school learning things like matrix multiplication and linear algebra, maybe an introduction to some coding. Uh, that would carry you into college where you would learn even more complicated math like eigenvectors and convolutions. You would probably do some advanced coding with things like Python or C++. Uh, and then finally, after you know years and years of doing this, you probably have a degree or maybe two from a university, and you would be wise and experienced enough to build and use your own face recognition system. Uh, all that's really changed over the last five years. Now, anyone uh, anywhere in the world, really, uh, with access to the internet and a GitHub account, uh, can go online and download uh, what's really pretty accurate face recognition software. Uh, the push to open source that software has been a good thing, right? It means you no longer have to be a mathematician or a software engineer to download and use these computer programs, you know, whether it's just on your own fun project or for a business. Uh, but with face recognition, we need to be a little bit careful because it deals with people's personal information, right? It's pictures of their face, it's their identity. So it's a good idea to sort of understand how it works uh, and when it might not work before you really start using it. And that's what we're going to do today. So face recognition works something like this. Uh, we start off with a picture of a human and we use something called computer vision to do uh, a couple of things. First, we isolate the area around the human's face. And second, we find all the points that are associated with features of his or her face. So this are things like, you know, the corners of the end of the mouth, the, where the nose is, where the eyes are, where the cheeks are, et cetera. Uh, all these points get saved into something called a face recognition template. Uh, that's basically what the math thinks your face looks like. Uh, we then get another template from either the same person or a different person and use even more math to compare the two templates and we get a score. Uh, that score is the computer program telling you how similar it thinks those two images are. Uh, you then have to decide if that score is high enough for you to say, okay, those two people are a match or the opposite, that score is too low, uh, meaning those two people are actually different. Uh, let's take a look at what kind of mistakes a face recognition program can make. There's two really. Uh, first, a face recognition program can accidentally think that two pictures of you are not the same. And then the second thing that can happen is a face recognition program can accidentally think a picture of you and a picture of someone else are the same. Uh, so let's look at what this sort of looks like in real life. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows who this is, right? This is Daniel Radcliffe, AKA Harry Potter. 
Uh, and let's think about what might cause a computer program to think another picture of Daniel Radcliffe is actually not him. Uh, so what about maybe this picture, for example? He doesn't look quite the same there, and that's because he's actually much younger, and indeed aging is really one of those things that can cause face recognition to not recognize people. Um, but there's others. So what about this picture? Uh, I actually myself am not really sure that that's Daniel Radcliffe. It, it could be, uh, but it's definitely hard to tell with the, the long hair, the beard, he's got glasses on, he's got a hat. It looks like maybe he stayed out a little late last night. And, and those are all things that can also uh, mess up a face recognition computer program and cause them to think, you know, two pictures of what in reality are the same person are not the same. Uh, the other kind of error a face recognition program makes a little bit different. So again, we all know this is Harry Potter, but ask yourself, who do you think this guy is? Uh, it turns out that even though it looks a lot like Daniel Radcliffe, it's actually not Daniel Radcliffe. It's just uh, some guy in actually in Southampton who happens to look a whole lot like him and he goes around on Instagram posting pictures and that's all, all well and good. Um, but it's a problem for face recognition, right? Now, would a face recognition program say that these two pictures are the same. It kind of depends on how good that program is. Uh, but the point here is that, you know, as responsible users of face recognition, you need to recognize that this kind of computer program can make mistakes, right? It's a possibility. You need to account for that in any FR system you would want to use for either a fun project or for work. Uh, so I mentioned that phrase responsible users on the last slide, and I just want to sort of highlight a couple of other points that go into that responsibility category. Uh, the first thing we have to watch out for with face recognition and, and really all AI systems that interact with humans is that they work for all different kinds of humans, right? So I mentioned those computer vision steps before that do things like finding a face and finding points on a face. Uh, what if that part of my system isn't good at finding faces when maybe people have dark skin, for example? Or what if it thinks women faces change more frequently than men's just because women sometimes put on makeup in the morning, right? It's not a guarantee that this happens with every system. In fact, there are some really good face recognition systems out there that treat people almost identically, uh, regardless of their gender, their race, or their age. Um, but it's your job as a responsible user of face recognition to think about these things and if your system is going to interact with all different kinds of people, uh, you need to test it and make sure that it's treating those people with the same, uh, you know, regardless of how those people look. Uh, this lesson also applies to sort of a different category of stuff we can do with faces. It's called facial analytics. Uh, facial analytics is when you take a picture of a face and you use it to determine something other than someone's identity. So for example, uh, you could use it to try to guess someone's emotional state, right? Are they happy? Are they sad? Uh, you could try to figure out if that person's concentrating or if they're frustrated just based on, you know, a picture of their face. Uh, applications like this are, are even harder to do well in a way that works for everyone uh, because everyone's idea of concentration or happy or sad, you know, looks very different. I don't make the same face as you make when I'm happy, for example. Uh, if you want to pursue an application like this, you need to be aware of this fact and sort of engineer alternatives for when the computer program, you know, simply guesses that state incorrectly because it's, it's probably going to happen. Um, you know, if there's not good alternatives, you should maybe think about if using a, a system based on faces uh, that tries to do this is the right path moving forward. Uh, that brings me to my second thing that I think we have to watch out for with face recognition, and that's the use case. Uh, so just because you can do something with a face recognition system doesn't mean you should. Uh, you know, so for example, it's, it's one thing for me to use face recognition to unlock my phone or, or to go get into the gym, uh, but those are things I signed up for. Uh, I'm comfortable with face recognition being used in that way, and if I'm not, there's alternatives, right? Uh, I mentioned I could, I could use a pen maybe to get into my phone instead. Um, you know, it's another thing for me to stick a camera out my window and try to use face recognition on everyone that walks down the street, right? Uh, those people may be enjoying a walk sort of privately, and it's not really fair for me as, as just John Howard, this crazy computer scientist, to take their picture and use it in my face recognition system, right? I didn't ask their permission to do that. Uh, all that being said, face recognition is being used for some incredibly powerful and I think really good purposes around the world. Uh, for example, uh, did you know that, that newborns actually need like dozens of different vaccinations over their first 18 months, and they need them in this very sort of precise order and on a very precise timeline? 
Uh, we're all also going to need a new COVID vaccine once someone figures that out. Um, people have sort of proposed the idea of using face recognition or maybe another biometric to sort of track vaccination schedules. Uh, I think, you know, particularly for newborns, maybe those that are born into sort of extreme poverty where it's, it's really difficult to get, um, you know, a traditional ID card, something like a driver's license. This might be the only way to sort of track that information and keep it associated with that person. Um, also, you know, maybe in the same way we could remember who got a COVID vaccination and, and use that to help people get back to work. I don't know. Uh, education is really another area uh, that's got some face recognition uses. So uh, my friends with older children have been complaining to me that kids are being asked to memorize uh, really dozens of new passwords for these sort of remote education systems, right? So you've got a teacher wants you to use a password for Google Docs and you've got another password because the teacher wants you to use Zoom. And uh, really what happens when we're asked to memorize lots of passwords like that is one, we either end up reusing passwords, or two, we make really crummy passwords. And both of those are kind of bad from a security standpoint. So could we just use face recognition to log into all these systems and that way we wouldn't have to have all these different passwords. Um, all of these are sort of ideas that I think could be used to make our world a better place, a safer place. And uh, I think that's something that, you know, I hope you consider as you continue to work on your teens and AI COVID hackathon projects. Uh, so with that, yeah, I'm gonna switch computers and try to do a little live face recognition demo. Uh, so bear with me for just one second. Okay, uh, so what you're looking at here is actually a little Python code that a friend of mine Dr. Evgeny Sirotin put together as a little example app. Uh, you can actually find this Python code on Evgeny's GitHub account. This is one of those open source applications I mentioned. It uses entirely open source code available to the public. So you could use this on you know, a project of your choosing. Uh, I'll show you what this does. It actually takes over um, the video that I was using to talk into a little bit earlier and it starts running those video frames through a face recognition program. Uh, and so now that face recognition program can sort of augment the video in all sorts of fun ways. So for example, I mentioned those points earlier on the face that face recognition uses. You can highlight those on my face right now. So we can see all these points around my mouth and my nose and my eyes. Uh, and hopefully those are sort of staying in the right spot even as I continue to talk and maybe make very odd face gestures. Uh, the other thing I set this up to do is actually to do a little identification task. So I made a little gallery here of myself, uh, my friend, Dr. Evgeny and Harry Potter. And what I can do is tell uh, this face recognition program to grab a frame from the webcam and actually figure out which one of those three people that frame looks like the most. So when I do that, the picture pops up, that was me. So that's working, right? That's the correct outcome there. It didn't pop up a picture of Harry Potter or of Evgeny. Um, we talked earlier about how things like maybe, you know, facial hair and hats and everything might prevent a face recognition application from working. So we can give that, we can test that theory right here as well. So I can add a little mustache to my face and then rerun that same identification thing. We can see there, it still got me. So this mustache wasn't enough uh, to fool or to, to make me not recognizable to the face recognition system. Uh, but I can do some other stuff too. I could wear glasses, have you know, maybe a different nose, hairy eyebrows, and a different kind of mustache. And if I try to identify myself now, uh, you can see there, I just did it. Um, my image didn't pop up, right? So it, it wasn't similar enough to that picture I showed you in the gallery with my uh, glasses and my new nose and my uh, fuzzy eyebrows to be identified. Uh, so that's working here. Uh, really, we can do all sorts of fun stuff with this. Beauties of computer vision. I'm also not recognized, you know, as half elephant. Um, right, and so that's basically the end of my live face recognition demo. Like I said, you can find all this code uh, out there on GitHub. If you'd like to use it, please don't hesitate. Uh, it's there for your enjoyment. Um, that's really it for my talk today. You know, if this kind of stuff interests you, I put my Twitter handle in the slides. It's uh, at John underscore J underscore Howard. Talk about this stuff a lot on things like Twitter and LinkedIn. You know, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I wish you all the best with your COVID hackathon projects. Thanks for your time.